You're in the ER and it's chaos as usual. Your patient has just arrived in severe respiratory distress from a CHF exacerbation. The provider is discussing starting the patient on non-invasive ventilation, but you realize you're not entirely sure about the difference between CPAP and BiPAP or how they work. What do they actually do? When should you use one over the other? And what's your role as the nurse? In this video, we'll break it all down. You'll learn the key differences between CPAP and BiPAP, the conditions each is used for, and how to confidently manage these interventions as an ER nurse. By the end, you're going to have a solid understanding. First, let's quickly review how normal breathing works and how it's impacted by CHF. When you take a breath in, air carrying oxygen travels down to the alveoli. Here, oxygen is exchanged for carbon dioxide with your blood. The oxygen-rich blood circulates throughout your body while the CO2 is exhaled out. But in CHF, the heart can't pump blood effectively. Blood starts to back up into the vessels in the lungs, causing increased pressure inside them. This extra pressure causes fluid to leak out of the vessels and into the alveoli, otherwise known as pulmonary edema. The fluid in the alveoli acts like a barrier, blocking the exchange of oxygen and CO2. As a result, your patient struggles to get enough oxygen and has to work much harder to breathe. This is why they often appear short of breath, fatigued, or even in respiratory distress during a CHF exacerbation as they are working harder and harder to breathe in for gas exchange. Let's talk about CPAP which stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. CPAP's primary function is to improve oxygenation. It does this by providing a single, steady stream of air pressure during both inhalation and exhalation that provides oxygen. Think of it like a gentle but constant airflow that keeps the airways and alveoli open and helps push the fluid back into the vessels. This steady pressure helps oxygen move into the lungs more effectively by preventing alveolar collapse or the fluid from blocking gas exchange. It's especially useful in conditions like obstructive sleep apnea, but in the ER, you may see it with mild to moderate CHF exacerbations with pulmonary edema, where the patient is struggling to get enough oxygen. By providing that constant pressure and oxygen, it helps stabilize these mild to moderate patients. However, CPAP alone isn't primarily used in the ER because it doesn't help with patients who are fatigued, patients who are tiring out, and are showing signs of impending respiratory failure. That is where BiPAP comes in handy. BiPAP, or bi-level positive airway pressure, unlike CPAP, which only provides a single steady pressure, BiPAP delivers two different pressures, one for breathing in and one for breathing out. The higher pressure during inhalation, called IPAP or inspiratory positive airway pressure helps push air into the lungs. This extra push helps patients who are tiring out breathe easier since they don't have to work as hard to get air in. This push of oxygenated air also helps ventilate by providing air volume that will exchange oxygen for CO2, therefore improving oxygen delivery and helping the patient exhale CO2 more effectively. Then there's also the lower pressure during exhalation called EPAP or expiratory positive airway pressure, which just like CPAP helps keep the airways and alveoli open. So BiPAP is especially useful for patients who are more sick or more fatigued like those with COPD exacerbations, severe congestive heart failure exacerbations, and or respiratory failure. It's designed to not only improve oxygenation, but also help ventilate and remove CO2 and to make it easier to take breaths for patients who are towering out as it provides that initial push of air, that the IPAP. Now, let's break down how CPAP and BiPAP are used for CHF patients depending on the severity of their condition. CPAP is typically used for patients with mild to moderate pulmonary edema caused by CHF. It works by improving oxygenation, reducing fluid in the lungs, and decreasing both preload and afterload on the heart. These patients usually have oxygenation issues, but no significant CO2 retention. They have minimal work of breathing and have no signs of ventilatory fatigue, or impending respiratory failure. On the other hand, BiPAP is better suited for patients with severe pulmonary edema, particularly when they are showing signs of hypercapnia or respiratory fatigue. BiPAP provides dual pressure support, which not only improves oxygenation, but also helps with ventilation. 
By assisting both inhal inhalation and exhalation, BiPAP reduces the work of breathing, which is crucial for patients whose respiratory muscles are overworked and nearing failure. In short, use CPAP for oxygenation problems without significant CO2 retention, and BiPAP when the patient is more fatigued, has hypercapnia, and is showing signs of impending respiratory failure. By the way, if you're finding this helpful and want to save time and energy with mastering the chaos of the ER, check out our book and course. They are packed with everything you need, including foundational material, quizzes, and practical tips to help you feel confident and prepared in the ER. You can also join the channel as a member and gain access to the course by clicking the join button. You can find the links in the pinned comment and description below. Now, while respiratory therapy is responsible for setting up CPAP or BiPAP, as the nurse, it's critical for you to know how to manage and monitor the patient effectively. First, you need to know how to ensure a proper seal. Check for air leaks, and if you detect leak, reposition the mask and adjust the straps. But remember not to over tighten. It should be snug but comfortable. Patients with a low GCS are not candidates for CPAP or BiPAP because they can't protect their airway or take the mask off if they need to in an emergency. It's also important to know how to remove the mask as needed for emergencies. And then keep in mind that non-invasive ventilation is only one part of the CHF treatment. You'll likely be administering medications like nitroglycerin and Lasix, so make sure these interventions are carried out quickly and efficiently. Finally, as a nurse, you're the one at the bedside most often. Close monitoring is your key role. Watch for any signs that the treatment isn't working, like persistent respiratory distress or worsening vital signs, and communicate these changes with the team to ensure the patient gets the care and interventions that they need. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work, and here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.